them. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, brother, sister, and venerable. Uh, let us start our Bidma class by paying homage to Bodha by Namo Tassa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Dhamma Sambo Tassa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Namo Sambo Tassa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samba Sambo Tassa Uh, so can I start now? Yes, Yari. Okay, thank you very much. Good uh, job, and Masri. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all the venerables and dear brothers and sisters in the Denmark. So it's nice to meet you again. And we are already in our fourth week. So for the first three weeks, we have looked at a bit on getting to know our mind. The first part is the introduction and see the textual analysis of the teachings of the Buddha in terms of the Vinaya disciplinary rules, Sautanda, the discourses, and the Abhidhamma, the teaching on the ultimate realities. And the next two lectures follow up with getting to know our mind part one and part two. And last week, if you uh, remember, we have touched upon the unwholesome mental states, Akusala Jedasika, uh, amounting to altogether 14. So this week, along with the unwholesome uh, mental states, Akusala Jedasika, I have thought of introducing you to unwholesome consciousness, which in Pali we call Akusala Jeda. And I hope by now you are familiar with the term Kusala, Akusala, that is the wholesome, unwholesome, or we can also say moral or immoral, ethical or unethical, skillful or unskillful. And of course, Jada means consciousness, mental states, Jada Sika. So I hope at least you are with me so far. Then to go along with the 14 unwholesome mental states, we have the unwholesome consciousness, Akusala Jada. So this week, we will see how the unwholesome mental states and unwholesome consciousness, they arise or they coexist together. And in terms of Abhidhamma, we say how they associate together. So in order that we understand that to a full extent or to understand better, I have also thought of introducing you with the ethically variable mental states, which in Pali is the Anya Samana. Here I haven't given you. So for today, we will touch upon two 
uh, subtopics, that is the ethically variable mental states and unwholesome consciousness, Akusala Jada. So there we go. So this is the slide from the previous lectures, which I have recalled for your memory. That is the classification of the mental states. And let me again review that Abhidhamma focuses on the mainly two topics, that is the concept or the penyati and the ultimate realities. So in the first and the second lecture, we have already uh, understood that penyati, the concept and the ultimate realities, paramata are equally important. We can stay away from any of these and they are beautifully uh, connected to each other uh, for the better or the complete understanding of the teachings of the Buddha. So going to the ultimate realities, the first one, if you remember, is the consciousness. In Pali, we call Jada. And the second one being this one, mental states or Jadasiga. We have already um, seen that a combination of this consciousness, Jada, and the states of mind or the mental states, Jita Siga, they make up is uh, what we call mind, one part of our body, as we are composed of mind and body, or in another terms, the five aggregates that also we have already seen. So here we can see that Abhidhamma classifies 52 mental states. Yes, the Theravada Abhidhamma explain about 52 kinds of mental states, which we can divide into three main groups, okay? The first one is the ethically variable mental states, which in Pali is the Enya Samana Jitasika, okay? Enya Samana, in Myanmar or in Burmese, we call Enya Taman. So along with this name go, ethically variable, so what are the ethical states? We can see down there unwholesome mental states and beautiful mental states. It means these 13 ethically variable states are agreeable to both unwholesome and beautiful. Okay, I will repeat. These 13 ethically variable or the common mental states along with their name are common to both unwholesome, akusala, and beautiful sobhana. So in this way, we can see that there are altogether three main groups, uh, which make up the 52 mental states. So here the explanation is there. Ethically variables are states that are compatible with both unwholesome, akusala, and beautiful mental states. So what else do they do apart from being compatible or agreeable with them? Uh, they are smart and they are intelligent. They manage the mind. Once they come into our mind, they manage the mind, right? With their ethical qualities, either unwholesome or wholesome. So this is the brief overview of the uh, mental states. So now, um, the first one, which we will mainly focus today is the ethically variable or another word, another interpretation is the common mental states, which amount to 13, one, three. So these 13 can be further divided into two groups. The first one is the uh, universal and another one, the particular. So here I have um, given you the first group, seven universal mental states. So why are they called universal? So I think the term itself is quite um, simple and easy to understand. By universal, we understand that it is, it concerns everyone. It is agreeable to everyone. It is not private. It is not specific. It is not particular, but it is agreeable or it is common to each and everyone on earth. That's why it's called universal, right? So in the same way, these mental states, because they always exist together, it means they stay together. 
So we use these technical terms, okay, kindly note exist or associate with. So we often see these terms exist together or the coexistence or the associate with. It means they are together, the state of being together or the togetherness, that is the meaning. Because they are together with every type of jada, they are known as the sabha jada sadharana. Okay, sabha jada sadharana. Sabha, you might know me all or every, and jada is the consciousness sadharana means here associate with. So associate with every kind of consciousness. So. Uh, we have classified consciousness in various ways, and one way I have introduced you is by mean of type, jati. That is unwholesome, akusala, another one, wholesome, kusala, right? So we perform good action, bad action, and we will have the result accordingly. So this result we call resultant type of consciousness, or in Pali we call vipaka. Okay, you do good and you will have good result, right? Kusala, good, wholesome, moral, ethical, skillful. And as a result, you will have its good result. That is the Kusala Vibhaga. And another one, I might do something evil. I might have jealousy or I might have anger or I might have remorse or my mind is so restless that I can't concentrate on anything or whatever. And as a result, there will be some uh, resultant type as well. That is the akusala vipaka. And some consciousness, they just merely operate or function. That's why we call them functional consciousness, which in Pali is the kiriya jeda. So I have already introduced that kiriya jeda or the functional consciousness arise mostly in the Arahant, who have already completely eradicated the mental impurities or the mental defilements. Right? But in human beings also, there are two types of functional consciousness that can arise, which we will see later. So in us, only two functional consciousness and the remaining, they are mainly concerned with the Arahanta, right? So, Whatever type of jada it may be, either wholesome or unwholesome or resultant or functional, these seven universals are always there or agreeable. So here it says that this one consciousness and seven universal mental states, they form the basic unit of mind. And Rector Seattle called this one as eight in one. It shows the compactness right, compactness. So these days we, um, human beings are very busy and we can't spend time. So everything has to come ready. Uh, coffee, coffee mix, tea mix, three in one, coffee, um, sugar and milk. So everything has to be ready, instant noodle. So that shows the compactness. So here also the same, this, our mind is composed of the minimum or the basic unit or the least number is eight, that is one consciousness and uh, seven, these universal mental states. For example, sense consciousness. So when we are awake, we have all the sense consciousness, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and of course, touching. Here, we talk about five sense consciousness. Now you are awake, then you can see me, you can hear me, maybe if you're taking coffee or tea or you're taking some snack for lunch or for dinner, you might have some smell that you might know the taste. And of course, all of us are sitting. So we have this um, body consciousness as well. So this consciousness always coexists. It means exist together or associate with these seven universal. So what are these seven universal? Let's see. Um, actually, I have drawn this and I have to admit that I, I'm not good at drawing and fortunately I, I could do it today. So see, 
consciousness is there in the center, right? Consciousness is there in the center and it is surrounded by altogether seven universal mental states. We can see contact, the first one. We, we go from the top, contact after that, and we go the clockwise position, contact, feeling, perception, motivation, one-pointedness, mental life faculty and attention, right? Some sound so technical, but some uh, we are familiar, right? So we will see each and every detail of, of them. When I say that contact after that feeling, after that perception, a motivation, I say that I'm going clockwise position, right? So uh, counting them one by one. So please understand that this is not the order of arising. This is the order of teaching, right? So when we talk about the uh, teaching of the Buddha, there are different order, different order of teaching as we can see or we can listen, but the order of arising is something different. Here, the first one is the context. So this is to be followed by feeling, the third one perception, the fourth motivation or volition, and the fifth one pointedness, next mental life faculty, and the last one is the attention, altogether seven. So please understand this seven is not the order of arising. It does not mean that Con, uh, feeling arises after contact and perception arises after contact and feeling it is not as such, they arises at the same time. And actually with our human eye, it is rather, in, rather indivisible. It means we are not able to divide it with our natural eye or with our understanding. So, and this is what the Buddha has analyzed us so that we could see it. Simply, it is like that. Um, milk is uh, mostly uh, mixed with water. So when water is added to milk, it is difficult to separate these two. And in the same way, the water from the different rivers or different lakes, they would come together and meet together, combine, making the ocean water. So it would be very difficult to differentiate which water is coming from which part of the world or south path, southern path, northern, eastern and western and so on. And in the same way, it is very difficult, it says that to uh, divide this nature or the working nature of these mental states. Now let's see what they perform. So the first one is the contact. So um, I have this pen near me, so I normally give you this example. I'm touching this, right? So my hand is touching the pen. But this touch is not the physical touch. When I touch this, this is I'm physically touching, right? And I also have this uh, table clock, then I'm also physically touching the clock. But this contact or pasa is not such kind of physical touch. It say it is mental contact, mental touch. So let's move on what it says. Mental touching or impingement. This is another technical term. Impingement here means touching, right? Impingement of the object on the mind. Then let's go back to this slide. When we talk about consciousness, we must not forget that the nature of consciousness is the awareness or knowing of the object, right? So when we say, whenever we say about consciousness, we always have to remember the object. Consciousness is never apart from object because its nature is noting the, oh, sorry, uh, aware of the object. In that awareness, there is no judgment. So it also say non-judgmental awareness or bare awareness is the nature of consciousness. So this consciousness, when it awares the object, these seven, they are working together. This is the meaning. Now, moving back again to this contact passa. 
on the third line here, it's mentioned that our mind is always touched by something. So what kind of touch, right? The mind and the object touching together, the consciousness and the object touching together, the object of pleasure. Suppose somebody passed the exam or got promoted or got some kind of um, good position and they are so happy, then seeing them, how do you feel? You also feel happy, right? Then how about fear? Any object that we used to feel fearful, also when it is mentally touched, then we have this, right? Suppose I'm afraid of the height, for example, then somebody in the circus would be walking on a rope or on a thin line on a, or, or on a thin bar, right? Walking there, what happened? Looking at this, we might feel frightful. Oh, that person is going to fall down or not. Or another one, like it would be very dark at night and it's also raining and suppose uh, you're afraid of snake. Then you suddenly saw a long type, a long object, so which looked like a snake. And suddenly we got shocked, right? Then is it the snake? Then we tend to uh, stay away from that with the thought that it is the snake. But actually, it happened to be the rope, or it happened to be a branch or something. So it didn't come and touch us physically. It didn't come and touch our eye, not our hand, our body, but we are touched by this. And another prominent example, like uh, somebody is eating lime, lime fruit, which is very sour. Then uh, you would also notice the different appearance and the sensation that person have it. And what do you feel? Looking at that lime, you also feel that you have saliva in your mouth and something, right? Then again, um, when you see something that would you very surprising, then at that time also we have this contact. So it says that our mind is always touched by something, by the object of either pleasure or joy or fear or surprise or whatever. You see your like favorite food, uh, you, you feel like mouth watering because uh, the commercials would also say like it is mouth watering tasty or so. So this is the nature of the contact, right? So what happened when there is contact in mind? Of course, there is feeling. Then regarding that feeling, once I have introduced, I think in the first lecture, feeling um, in our understanding of our Myanmar people is something sort of painful or something sort of unpleasant. But according to Abhidhamma, feeling itself, it is, um, it has no pleasant or no unpleasant thing as such because the nature of feeling itself or the characteristic of feeling is just experiencing the object. Experiencing the object. So it enjoy the desirable on the undesirable aspect of the object. And here we can have this example. So it is likened to the king fully enjoying the food prepared by the chef. So in olden days, it says that the king, uh, the chef has to prepare like tens of hundreds of cuisine for the king. And as a chef prepare the cuisine, they also have to take, they also have to try, try to have a taste of how the curry or the cuisine is like, right? And when it is um, satisfied, or when they have prepared well, they lay out for the king and it is the king who fully enjoy the taste of the food. It means that the chef also have a taste of the food, but this is a very little amount. But it is the king who would sit down and fully enjoy the taste of the object. So this is the meaning. So now we have seen two mental states, contact, pasa, and Vedana feeling, please understand these two are always with us. It means we are always felt by something. 
then how many kinds of feelings do we have? There are different kinds of feeling. There are different kinds of feeling that is analyzed in Abhidhamma or in the Sotanda. So this is five kinds of feeling that is um, classified in terms of the faculty in the Riyadh. So here, the first one, bodily pleasure. You can see the first and the second one, bodily pleasure and bodily pain, right? So we have all together five kinds of feeling and the first two, they are bodily feeling. So what include that bodily feeling or sukha? In Pali, we call sukha, right? It includes all form of bodily pleasure, comfort and ease. So since we're going to sit for two hours, like uh, you will try to prepare a seat that would be quite convenient and comfortable, sorry, for you to sit. And that would be, that would not make you any pain or any pressure as such. So this bodily pressure, pleasure, it includes all form of comfort and ease. And this is apparent. And on the contrary, that is the bodily pain. So when you are taking a seat in a comfortable seat, then uh, you might have also taken shower, for example, and you might have taken meal, then you are quite comfortable, then you feel energized, right? This is the sukha that you have pleasure in your physical body. And on the contrary, bodily pain, sitting for two hours, sitting for one hour, or for example, during meditation, because normally we can't move. We can't move, we normally don't move during meditation, but um, that is for the purpose of getting concentration. But some methods would allow to move and to make changes. Yes, even when you make changes, you are supposed to do with the uh, help of the mindfulness so that the mind remain concentrated. So sitting long or when you have headache, when you have um, a toothache or sometimes stomach aches, whatever pain it would come in your body that undergoes uh, under this bodily pain or dokha. So sometimes you feel discomfort in your body or you feel sort of uneasy. You take some food that is not suitable for you. So you feel discomfort and you feel uncomfortable. So all these come under this bodily pain. And another one, now we come to the uh, mental pleasure or the pleasant feeling. So this is sort of, it cover all levels and degrees of happiness and joy. And of course, ease in mind. So that is the um, pleasant feeling. The Pali word is the Salmanasa. So it come from the Su and Mana. The originally su mana, su mean good and mana mean mind, good mind. Here, good mind does not mean that it is uh, kusala. Good mind means something that is pleasant, something that is pleasing to the mind. So it can be any object. It can be your favorite food or it can be um, uh, your favorite cuisine or whatever. It can be anything or it can be your favorite dress right? Or it can be your favorite uh, food or favorite coffee or whatever. And seeing that or enjoying that, you have this pleasure or joy in mind. That is the pleasant feeling. Because later we will see that this pleasant feeling, it arises with both good mind and evil mind, right? So uh, this is the, just the brief introduction to that. And another one, Dormanasa. Do and mana, do mean not good, undesirable. Su, as you su here is a Pali word, su mana, good mind, something desirable, something pleasing. And do mana, which is changed into dormanasa, it is just the total opposite. You see somebody whom you dislike, you feel pain, or it's a sore to, to your eye. It doesn't come and hit to your eye, but seeing that, seeing that person, you feel that that person is a sore to my eye, right? 
we use this metaphor to mention that. Or seeing some sound that is unpleasant, or sometimes maybe you are meditating, or you are reading a book, or you are enjoying your music, whatever. Then suddenly the loudspeaker came. Oh, so disturbing, so annoying. Then I feel sort of uh, unhappy and sort of dislike. So this is Dormanasa. And another one, or the last one here, that is the Pali term is the Upekha. Right, this Upekha is very uh, mistaken, mistakenly understood. Burmese people say that Upekha means just ignore. Okay, you just keep Upekha, you ignore everything. Don't care that person either, it would be uh, whatever, that person would say, you just ignore that. Don't take that person into account. That is upekha. But this upekha is somewhat different. This is neither pain nor pleasure. It say, this is the midpoint between pain and pleasure, neither like nor dislike. People have different liking. Okay. Um, do you like chocolate? To some, it would be fabric. Yes. Oh, I, I feel um, so tasty to have this chocolate. It is so delicate. And it is specially uh, prepared um, with the nuts inside, for example. Then for those, that would be the object that they want. But to some, no, no, I don't like chocolate. I don't like the taste. And to some, uh, it's okay. If you give me, I will have it. If you don't give me, it's okay. Not that I like, nor I dislike. Such kind of feeling, right? So this is the upeka. So here you can find different translation, indifferent or equanimity or neutral. And here Siado Usatila used this term, hedonic neutrality. So this is five kinds of feeling upeka, right? And sometimes feeling is only threefold in terms of bodily pleasure, sukha, or bodily pain, dokha, and the last one, upekha, neither pain nor pleasure. So this there can also be some way of classifying feeling in terms of three kinds of feeling. But since all the feeling, they are subject to impermanent, they tend to change. You might be happy in the morning and you might not. And for the time being, you find it difficult or uneasy and maybe sort of you are not happy. Then after that, okay, I, I'm relaxed after this class. And or sometimes you feel uncomfortable in your body and you wish that it would go away soon. But after some time, some hours or some day, it would go away. So either pleasant or, or unpleasant either the feeling in you or the feeling in me or the feeling of everyone, it is subject to change. It mean, it tend to change, it will change. That's why it is impermanent. Then what is impermanent, it produces suffering. In that way, the feeling can also be summed up or combined as only one that is unpleasant feeling, dokha, right? So let's move on to another one. Now we have seen three from the universal mental state that the contact, it touches the mind with the object and the feeling it experiences. And now come the perception, right? Perception is the senya. What is the nature or the function of perception? Perception means perceiving or taking note for future reference. So Rector Siado said, this is the noting system. So what is your noting system? Is it by writing down or typing in the computer or you just try to store in your, um, in your mind? Okay, so it would be different from one another. But of course we take notes most of the time or from time to time. Why do we have to take note? It is for the future reference. Of course, in this Abhidhamma class, you really have to note it. 
or if you don't want to note it also fine, but um, from time to time, I would recall your memory in the first lecture, I have said that in second lecture, we have dealt with this and the third lecture focus on that. And today what we will do that. So I always try to review and relate. It may recalling your memory, working your, your perception of this senior work. Um, so it is likened to carpenter making marks on the timber. So that is the example from the, let's say, commentary that is example in the olden days, because not every material is made of timber nowadays. It might be plastic or it might be fiber or it might be iron or uh, whatever. So in olden days, the carpenter, suppose he is going to make a table, he measure the wood and the big part, the flat part, this is for the top part and the side, this is for the side mark and this is for the draw and this is for the handle and I will put here or this will fit in there. He has to use the pen, a pencil and take note, draw line and number. This is the first one, the second, the third and how to fit in and in his mind also he would be making, making mental note and also it is necessary to note on the object or on the material. Right? This is what is Senya like? So what else does it do? So when we note it, we recognize it, we remember it. It says that recognizes what has been previously perceived. Yes, what you have previously noted, you remember. Uh, Sometimes we remember some of the lessons or the event that we have experienced or we have learned in our childhood day, right? So uh, this is the work of the Senya. And of course, uh, it is also part of mindfulness sati as well, which we will come later. Because sati or mindfulness has two aspects. One part is mindful and another part is remembering. So this is another part. So now going back to this Senya, it interpret the object by the features apprehended. So um, you see me then, suppose you see me for the first time, then you have to take note of me. Uh, this is the dress. Uh, suppose you are not familiar with the Myanmar culture or oh, this is the way the Myanmar nuns dress, right? Um, she is wearing sort of pink color and the shawl or the, uh, the badge is this uh, a bit brownish color and she is wearing the glasses and her feature, her, her face is round and her complexion is sort of a bit brown and she wear glasses and she would speak very fast and she would let you learn and sit for two hours. And this is the features that concern me that you take note in your mind. So that when you see me next time or when you see me outside, oh, this is Seali, then who has uh, conducting this Abhidhamma class. So, um, this is how you interpret me. You will interpret me seeing me, you will interpret me for your remembering, for your noting. But there might be some or other Seale who are similar to me, who look like me. And some people, they would mistake him. Maybe they would have known my behavior or my complexion or um, some sort of my appearance, then when you see somebody that look like me, then you do mistake, right? You do mistake in the sense that you uh, greet them or you call that Seali in my name. It can also happen. It may, it may be right or wrong depending on the apprehension. So actually this Senya is also like, um, very interesting. And now we have um, shaven our hair. And suppose I have long hair and I would value my hair when on head, on my head. And I've already given this example. But when it comes into the curry, or suppose it goes into your coffee, how would you feel that? You go to a restaurant, you order a good meal, expensive meal, delicious meal with your family and friend 
you see a fly or you see a strand or, or some strand of hair, then you feel disgusted because we have taken this to be disgusted. But the hair when on head, it is to be treasure. It is something to be taken care of. But when it goes into that, then we have this. Yes, so I, I hope we are back again. So while we are um, lost in the explanation of Senya, our connection also got lost, right? So now, welcome back again. Then this Senya, there can be some perversion in Pali we call Waipan Lhasa, like, um, the body, the dead body, that is disgusting, right? We might love and like our family so much, but when it is not alive anymore, we have to get discarded. We have to get created, right? Uh, sorry, cremated. But that body is the food or it is nutrition to the vultures, a kind of bird that eat uh, the dead body, right? To them. This is something desirable object. And uh, Rector Siada was given this example while I was listening to the Dhamma talk that normally this human excrement is disgusting, right? But suppose somebody would give you some reward. Maybe they need that excrement for some purposes. Right? And if somebody would give you some sort of reward or money or give you something in return, then that person would remove that disgust. And at that moment, that excrement is not disgusting anymore because it is overwhelmed by that greed, the greed of gaining something. So this is um, detail, explained in detail in the chapter on the thought process. And um, hopefully we can learn sometime later. Then let's move on to another one, Jedana. Uh, this is also um, very important because we all are interested in karma. And I have also mentioned that karma would be one of our sub themes. So this Jedana is the most significant factor in generating karma, it says. So Jedana is often translated as motivation or volition, and its function is the organizes the associated mental states to act upon the object or to be on the object. That is the meaning. I hope this organizes is a good word for now, right? Suppose you are an organizer, what will you do? You would contact the chairperson. You would also contact the uh, panelists or the paper presenters, and you would also contact the MC. And of course, you have to um, preside over inviting the guests, and you also have to take care of the registration, right? But this job, you can't do everything by yourself. You have to form a team, and you ask the members of the team or the team members to organize an event, right? This is the meaning. So, Jedana is like that. It motivates other factors to engage on the object. It means like motivating other team members to work their own duty or their own responsibility. So 
he would ask the chairperson to preside over the uh, session, paper reading session or the opening session or the closing uh, ceremony or whatever. And the uh, um, panelists to do presentation at the uh, event or the seminar or the conference and the MC to uh, take care of the ceremony so that the ceremony would go smoothly and in time. And the, and, and the facilitators like the ushers to bring people and so that they can take seated in their um, places assigned to them. So this is the function of this jadana. So that's why it say it is likened to an organizer or a coordinator or a chief pupil. So I hope it should be clear by now. It is more significance. It is most responsible factor in causing or in generating karma. So how did the Buddha say? Monks, I call Jedana karma. So this is a very common saying or the teaching in Buddhism. Jedana ham, break away, karma. Ah, now you can hear me. Do you? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Siali. Ah, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, maybe it must be so boring, so the Zoom is given a break to you. Often, so that maybe you can yawn or you can sit back or you can just get up and have a, uh, a cup of water or whatever, given a break to us. Then, Going back to this jadana, um, a significant and a well-known saying in Buddhism regarding karma is the monks I call jadana karma because the Buddha was given address to the monks, and it would also be it can also be the audience because the definition of this um, bhikkhu or the monk. Um, there is one definition regarding this. A person who is uh, trying to practice to get out of this samsara or rounds of rebirth is bhikkhu, is a monk. Or, per, or in another, we can, we can say a person who is contemplating on the fear or who sees the fear in the existences or round of rebirth or samsara is metaphorically also addressed as bhikkhu. So um, because we try to study Buddhist, Buddhist teaching and put it into practice with the aim or purpose of getting liberating from this samsara. So we might all as the disciple of the Buddha would be addressed as bhikkhus as well as a community. Then what happened when this jadana is karma? It says that having willed 
it means with jetana, with motivation. One acts through body, speech, and mind. It means we do many activities. <clears throat> Sorry, sometimes out of bodily, out of body, sometimes through speech, sometimes in mind. The thought of helping others, like especially in this time of COVID, that you would think of helping others or sharing others. Or sometimes that you might um, think of uh, going for a trip after the COVID. This is also the thought. Or out of bodily action, you had tried to help others. A person is going to cross the road and you try to help that person because that person uh, was carrying heavy items or that person would need a seat in the car or the bus or the train, then you offer, you share your seat. This is also bodily action that you have done. But for some people, they would kill animals as a habit, as a habit mean for fun. This is also bodily action and speech. Um, a person who practiced the Dhamma tried to speak well at the right time and also sweetly, not very harshly. But to some, using harsh speech or abusive speech becomes habitual and is not a mistake. So in this way, we people are doing sort of different kind of activities or the action through body, speech and mind. Okay, let's move on to another one. And this dam, because this uh, jetana, motivation of volition, it is uh, appear to be a synonymous term or it can be, or it has to be interpreted according to different context. Once there was a question, uh, what is the difference between Sankhata, conditioned, and Sankhara? So I have uh, once mentioned that I will explain when it comes to the occasion. And I have already explained about the conditions that like eye consciousness need altogether for condition. It means in order to see, we need good eyesight. We need something or the object to be seen. There should be enough light and you also pay attention. So these are the conditions that causes or that bring about the eye consciousness or seeing consciousness to arise. And in the same way, I have also mentioned that our physical body got changes due to four conditions, karma, our past karma, either good karma or evil karma. That's why we appear differently from one another. And then jada, yes, when you are happy, you feel light and cheerful in the body. And when you are ups, upset or when you are down, then you feel so heavy and easy in the body. And then Udu, the heat and cold and the nutrition, they can bring many changes to our body. It means because of the temperature, because of the nutriment, we have some sort of effect in our body, physical body. So this is what is meant by conditions, right? That is in Pali, we call Sankata. I have already mentioned. So our mind and our body, they tend to make changes because of these conditions. And this is the Sankara. Let's see Sankara. Number one here. So I have given four different kinds of contexts and it has to be understood and interpreted according to this context. Number one is the um, Jedana or the, the, sorry, the Sankara. It represents or it refers to the effort or the inducement or the prompting or encouragement by oneself or by others. Suppose, um, you don't know this cause, then your friend uh, introduce you that you should join this cause. But maybe to those who are new to Abhidhamma, they might feel hesitant at the beginning, right? That uh, it would be uh, very difficult since I don't have fundamental knowledge of Abhidhamma, but your friend encourage you, prompt you, or at least you uh, remember uh, one sentence or even a word a day that it would be helpful for you because it helped you yourself 
or uh, Buddhist teaching understand better. So your friend encourage you to do that. Or sometimes you don't want to go to movie because uh, you would like to do reading or you would like to join the Dhamma talk, but your friend insisted. So such kind of thing, right? So this is the sa sankarika, I mean prompted, that is the uh, induced or the uh, encouraged by oneself or by others. Sometimes we also have to encourage by ourselves. Uh, for example, normally we have to get up uh, at four plus in the morning to join chanting. Sometimes I might feel drowsy. I don't want to get up. So sometimes I have to encourage myself or that should, I, should, I shouldn't let the good habit go. Or sometimes my Dhamma sister would uh, encourage me or call me, let's go for chanting and get up. And so this is sort of thing. So it this promptitude or this encouragement would be by others or by yourself. So you will also understand this when we come to the uh, consciousness or that is together with greed. So when we have this law bar in mind, these factors are also there. So that, that time you will also understand this. So prompted or together with promptitude, that is the sa sankarika and unprompted, unprompted may automatic or doing yourself, nobody has to encourage. It goes automatic out of your own will, right? Because um, this is, um, uh, you, you want to do so much that nobody or yourself don't have to encourage, it goes automatic. So this is unprompted. So in this way, um, we have one kind of sankara in the name of prompted sa sankarika and unprompted or automatic a sankarika another one just as i was mentioning all conditioned phenomena are impermanent because this zoom application there must be some server or some controlling center or there might be the uh, current or electricity or that might we might also might need the device to work well only when these conditions are working together it goes smoothly so due to some reason or some problem it got interrupted or it got uh, disconnected so it means it is impermanent so sabbe sankara anicca sankara here mean all conditioned phenomena Except Nibbana, all phenomena are conditioned, either within yourself or within myself or whatever in our environment, either human being or the things near um, us, right? This table, for how long it will remain, it has lifespan. Or it might get burnt or it might get broken or when somebody has taken away, it won't be here. So there are many conditions um, that would manage these things. So in that, all conditioned phenomena are impermanent. Sabbe, sankara, and nature. It means everything, everything that is uh, under the influence or the management of these conditions, they are sankara. So what happened when they are impermanent? They would produce suffering, right? And another one, Sankara Kanda. We have already studied this term Kanda, right? Our physical, uh, sorry, our human being is composed of five aggregates or Kanda. Kanda means group or aggregates. So um, one is the physical body and one is the consciousness and the three remaining, they also belong to the 52 mental states. So this feeling we have seen just now, Vedana, it form, uh, aggregate itself, and Senya or perception form aggregate itself, and the remaining 50 mental states, it pertain to this mental formation aggregate or the Sankhara Khanda, okay? So Sankhara Khanda. And this is led by this volition Jidana. So the term Sankhara, Whenever it sees, uh, please understand it is sort of something relating to this motivation of volition or jidana. 
So this Sankara Khanda, it includes 5050 mental states apart from or except feeling, vedana, and perception, sanya. So all our thoughts that come in our minds and all our activities out of done out of this. This is called the mental formation aggregate Sankara. And the fourth one, it is with reference to the dependent origination. Um, the, in the dependent origination, it starts with the awaja or the ignorance. So it says that when we don't know, or when we are covered, our mind eye is covered, or when we are shrouded or shielded by the ignorance or delusion, we tend to do many kinds of activity. We will perform many kinds of activities, right? It means in our past, we do both good and bad. And as a result of good, we are born as a human being, right? Due to this Sankara, past activity, past good karma, we are born now as a human being. And this is what is meant by this Sankara Pejaya Venyanam, depending on volitional activities. So the activities that you do out of motivation or volition, this is known as the volitional activities. It is also Sankara. Because of this, we have consciousness. It refers to the very first moment in our life. That is the but this and the moment or the rebirth linking consciousness. It simply means you do good action. As a result, you are born as a human being. And at the very beginning of your life, since then you have this consciousness. This is the meaning to um, explain uh, in a simple way. So these are the context of the Sankara. And I was relating this Sankara with the reference to the Jedana which is translated as motivation or volition, right? So it's very important to have this uh, good motivation or volition. We Nama people say that jedana or sedana. When we talk about this jedana, we always refer to something good. We always take it to be good side. But according to Abhidhamma, we have to be careful. It can be on the bright side and it can also be on the... Um, dark sides, good sides and bad side. It can be agreeable to both, but at different time, not at the same time, of course. Okay, what would be the next one? One pointedness, eka kata. Eka kata. Eka here mean one, eka mean object. Having one object. Now let's say most of you are let's say, uh, trying to listen to me, paying attention, listening carefully. You are doing close listening. So my sound would be your object. You are listening to me, it means the sound. My sound would be your object, right? It doesn't matter you see me or not, it's more important that you can hear, you have to hear me, right? So sound is that object. So. This eka kada or one pointedness means one object, single object is very simple. Having just one object. I'm explaining to you, so my mind would be only on this particular word. My mind cannot go to meditation hall. My mind cannot go to the dining hall. My mind cannot go to the university. It must be only here. It means non wandering, not roaming about non-distraction, not going to other places. So this one-pointedness, it unites the associated states, right? It takes that power, the authority, unification of the mind on the object. The mind is with the object, not going anywhere, only on this object. So it is likened to water that keeps together grains of flour. You're going to make a bread or a donut or a cake or whatever, you would need water, some sort of liquid, either butter or water, so that you can mix or combine the grain or flour together so that you can make it uh, a dough, right? And another example here, it is likened to a flame in an airtight room. Airtight room means where there is no air. 
Suppose you put a candlelight, you offer a candlelight to the Buddha, or you offer a light at a shrine of your God or whatever, right? Or you might have a flame or a candlelight at your or dining table or breakfast table, and there is no aircon. So what would it, how would the flame be like? It would remain stable, not shaking. If you bring the, um, that candlelight in front of the aircon, then it, would be, it would, would be moving or shaking. The flame is not stable. That's why it's in an airtight room where there is no wind. It's a tranquil state of mind and it is identified with the concentration, but yes, we have to develop that ekagata. How? Please see the third line from the bottom. Ajana factor. This one-pointedness or ekagata form a jhana factor and it is prominent in jhana. In Nyama, we call zen, right? Jhana. Jhana means absorption. So during absorption, your mind is very stable. It means firmly fixed on an object for hours. Your mind is not wandering. Your mind doesn't go anywhere. Remain on a single object or remain on the prominent object during jhana. So, but it has to be developed. I say this because this ekagata or one-pointedness it can be with any kind of jada. It can be with any kind of jada. Either you are doing kusala or akusala, according to the, um, the, the principle, it is with that. But when it is not fully developed or when it is not practiced, it is not strong. It will come and go, it will come and go, it's like that. But when you train your mind, your concentration is higher, then it will stay firmly on the object. So it needs to be cultivated or it needs to be developed as a jhana factor because jhana means a combination of factor together. So some factor would come in the particular group as well. Let's move on to another one. Mental life faculty, jiwi dendriya. It means jiwita is life, and Andrea is the faculty. But here faculty is in the sense of having control over the respective place. It can be compared to the ministry, like ministry of culture. It, has, it is responsible uh, for the um, promotion or the maintenance of the one's culture in one's own nation or the country. And Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, they have responsibility in their own or specific uh, ministry. So that is the meaning. This mental life faculty, it has authority or power over life. It, may, it maintain the associated states. That's why I say these terms always come together. Associated states mean uh, the other six universal, fact, universal mental factors and the mind. So that, so that they can live up to their lifespan. So this mental life faculty maintain the associated mental states to live up to their lifespan. So it is the protection system. It is the protection system. It is like life, the uh, uh, life gut that would protect you, right? So it is likened to the water in the lotus stalk, keeping lotus alive. Where there is no more water in the lotus stem or the stalk, then the lotus would wither or lotus would dry or die. Another example, like a boatman who takes people to the other shore. So it can also be a charioteer or a pilot or a captain or a driver who bring people to the other place. So when we talk about the lifespan, there are some concepts that we got to understand. Three phases or three stages of existence. That is the arising, existing and disappearing. It means whatever come into appearance 
it exists and it would go. Now remember the now let's let's uh, listen to this word. I would say jeta. Right? C I T T A jeta, the word jeta. It would come, it stay and it go. The moment I spell the word jeta, it's already disappeared. So the first sentence already disappeared. So everything comes and go. Now it's already 10 past 10. So like one hour has gone by, it can never come back. It, won't ne it, it will never come back. It comes, it exists, and it goes. Gradually getting or making things mature. And so is our life, so is our day. The time comes, then the time stays for a while and the time goes. So we have this arising, existing or presence and disappearance or dissolution. If to familiar you with the Pali word, Opada TDN Benga. In Yama, we call Upat Tibin. So the lifespan of Nama, everything has lifespan. The lifespan of the battery or the lifespan of this machine or even the doors and window is say that it can bear up to opening 1000 times, for example. After 1000 times, it has no guarantee. It, it lifespan is gone. It need to be changed or it need to get fixed. And in the same way here, lifespan of Nama is three sub moments. It may all, then how long is that sub moment? Very, very short. It says that millions of, millions or billions of Jada would arise and come and go, even in a blink of the eye. How many times do you blink in a minute? We never count. Or in an hour. Or somebody say about the snapping of the finger, right? Even in a one snapping of finger, like millions of jada comes and go. That's why in, in one hour sitting or two hours sitting, you can be with me or you can go to work or you can talk to people or you can plan for your trip or you can do whatever. Even not moving from your place. It means the mind traveling, even while you are remaining here. So it's a very short moment, let's say shorter than seconds. So three sub moments or one mind moment. So this is sort of some technical um, terms and some teaching, but to make you familiar. So this GV dendria or this mental life faculty, it protects so that the jada in the associated states or the mind will stay up to their lifespan. So because we are alive, there is life jivita. Here it mentioned mental life faculty. And so is physical life faculty that concern our physical body. It means when we are die, this uh, jivita or this uh, state doesn't exist anymore. Then come to the last one, attention. Uh, very important and prominent as well. Attention, the Pali word is the manasikara. Okay, manasikara, attention. Mana, we know is mind. Kara means making. Manasik, si is a case ending. Uh, because Pali has gender, number, and cases like many other languages. Manasi means in mind, it shows the location. Where is the image make? The image is make in mind. Gara means making. Making in, in mind. So making the object in mind, that is the literal meaning or the meaning that is given by the word. So what does this attention do? Okay, when I say, oh, please listen carefully, then you pay more attention, right? In the public transport or the trans at the airport, for example, uh, the announcer would often say, may I have your attention, please? Then you stop talking and you listen carefully if your flight is calling for boarding, something like that. Then minds turning or adverting towards the object. So advertence or adverting here means simply mean turning, but this is the technical term. So for your reference, I have included that. Minds adverting, advertence or turning to the object. So it contact the associated states towards the object. 
just to write the associated state, uh, the state that exists together or the associated states towards the object. And it said to yoke, to yoke me to combine, to put together. Confrontation with an object, okay, facing to the object. So it's likened to the rudder of a ship directing to the destination. Suppose a ship is sailing, then you, um, the officer has to take care of the rudder to move towards the de destination, going to the north or northeast or seeing the wind and uh, seeing the clearance of the um, traffic and so on. And it's also likened to a charioteer sending horses towards the destination, directing towards the object. Don't go here and there, go to the object, go to the object, it's like that, right? Then uh, like the, um, uh, those staff, air crew, they will take your boarding pass and they will say, oh, go straight, go straight and take that car or take that shuttle bus, don't go to another place, right? Destination, going to your destination. So it say it is indispensable, it may, really essential. It cannot stay without this cognitive factor, cognitive main knowing present in all states of consciousness. So these seven are always with the consciousness. Okay, the first one, we will move, go back to the slides. Yes, the first one here, here's the consciousness. And we have this contact, the mind and the object getting together, touching together the mental touch and the feeling. There is the experiencing with the object, either mentally pleasant or mentally unpleasant, physically pleasant or physically unpleasant or sort of neutral feeling. Then perception, taking note, right? Taking note for future reference. And motivation, motivation, Volition, encouraging, right? It's like an organizer. Then one-pointedness, being on one object, quite here mean object, one-pointedness, remain on single object. The mind, this, when it is developed, it becomes concentration. And the mental life faculty, this is the lifeguard or the protection system, right? That keep uh, the mind alive and keep going. Then attention is very important. Without attention, you're not able to do anything. We have a saying in Myanmar, if you don't pay attention, you don't even see a big cave. It means sort of like big, uh, big building. If you pay attention, you can even see a small particle of dust, right? So um, attention is also very important. Then um, at the beginning, I say that ethically variable states, they account altogether 13. And seven are universal. It means they are agreeable to everyone. Like a friend who is agreeable to each and everyone in the class. But these people, they are different. Now let's see, six particular mental state. If I'm particular, I'm not agreeable to everyone. I'm agreeable to only few person. Let's say I'm choosy. So they are also sort of choosy. They would be together with those uh, that are agreeable to them. Ethically variable, but they are agreeable to both good and bad, but not with every consciousness that is the meaning. So here is explained found only in particular type of consciousness. So the, the meaning particular itself is clear, I think. So it may not agreeable with all or everyone, every consciousness. The first one, initial application. That is like the first thought. So what does it do? Direct or apply the mind onto the object. Attention, it directs your mind to the object. Okay, let's say attention. Look, please look. Attention say look, so you look. Then this Vitaka, yes, this is a pen. The first thought, okay? This is a pen, introducing. Vitaka is like introducing for the first time, for example. 
So um, the mind being or applying, mean being on the object that has been attended by this manasikara. So the leading of the mind onto the object. And it is also a kind of the jhana factor, but it has to be cultivated. It has to be cultivated. And jhana, jhana means absorption and anger means factor. So it is a constituent or a factor or a part of jhana. Jhana means it's a combination of factor. So it's a kind of factor, one factor. Synonym is the synonymous term is the sankapa. Sankapa means thought. We are familiar with this term, sama sankapa, in the Noble Eightfold Path. Right? Right understanding, it begins with right understanding, then right speech, right action, right livelihood, and then right thought. And when there is right thought, on the contrary, there is wrong thought as well. So here you can see, thought can be along with the good side or the dark side, good side or the evil side. So this is the nature of this vitaka or the initial application. Later, we will have more example to compare, right? So for the time being, this is the vitaka and let's move on to another. Sustained application. So it's, it's not clear what is sustained application. It sounds so technical, right? The Pali word is the vijara. Examine the object directed by the initial application. Then here, I would say, please have a look. So there is attention, you pay attention. And this is the pen. Then you would look at the pen. This is like the first thought, initial application. You please look carefully. Then you would look carefully. And someone was telling that the, the pen that I used to show in the class is very big, but because it is very close to the camera, it seemed to be very big, but actually it is not that much big. It is like a, a just a little bit longer than a natural pen. What pen is it, right? This is the cover, right? We, we can charge it. So you examine the pen. Oh, this they call it, they say eye pen. And the Ma download has kindly donated me so that I can use um, on writing on the uh, iPad while teaching. But for the time being, I prepared the slide so I, I don't use it now. Oh, so yes, this is iPad. So the first time I see this, I also have to take note and I see how to use it, how to charge it. So you have to join, you have to um, join to the iPad connect it, I mean the process of learning, right? So this is like the vijara, examining carefully, watching closely. Then we have very uh, simple or many examples. This vijaka and vijara, initial application and sustained application, right? These two terms. Initial application directs the mind to the object. Okay, look, the first thought. Sustained application, continued exercise, looking again and again, checking, examining, that is the meaning. We have many examples to compare this Viteka and Vijara. Viteka, a bird's spreading out its wing to fly. A bird is going to fly high. What does it do? It spread the wing, it tried to flap, and as it got the momentum, then it would fly up. And once it's already in the flying high in the sky, it would move in the air. Then it say vichara is the bird gliding through the air with a spreaded wing. You would see the bird gliding in the air very often. Yeah, they spread the wing and like um, they are enjoying in the uh, air with the wing spreaded, with a spreaded wing. And another example, vichaka is like a bee's diving toward a flower. There is a very sweet smelling and fragrant flower. And the bee would come down to take the pollen. Vitaka is the light, like the bee diving towards the flower. And after 
it has dived towards the flower, it would move over the flower. It would go and take the pollen and it would move around and again it will hang on the flowers, sometimes on the leaf, on the branch. So Vicheka is like that. The bees buzzing over the flower. And then another example, Vicheka is like the hand that holds the stain or dirty metal dish. And Vichara, it wipes the dish, it cleans the dish. So these many examples would clarify you or to distinguish between what is initial application, vijaka, and sustained application, vijara. Okay, let's move on to another one. Decision. Decision, adimauka. But this decision is not making decision like this is good, this is bad. It is not like that. Because literally, adimauka means releasing the mind onto the object. You release the mind onto the object, okay? You put your mind onto the object. Your mind is released. It means your mind is not controlled. You let the mind go to the object. And why it is known as decision? It say, releasing, while releasing the mind to the object, metaphorically, I'm saying, yes, this is the object. This is your object. Take it. It is like that. Decide that you don't go anywhere. This is the object. It means conviction, not groping. Groping means when there is no light, we go around in the dark, we grope something, or where is it the table, is it the chair, or is it the way, or uh, we, we have to grope so that we don't fall down in the dark. It is not groping. It is not searching. It is decisive. Yes, this is the object. Just being on the object. Just take decision, this is the object, it is like that. Okay, this is your place, you just sit in. You don't have to search for your place, your seat. It is like that. Uh, so such kind of decision, not like decision making that this object is good, this object is bad, not anything as such. It doesn't, it is not choosy. Okay, this is your object. Okay, I, I'm happy with what I am given, sort of thing like that. Energy, another one, viriya. We are familiar with this term, viriya. Viriya means the state or action of one who is vigorous. Vigorous means energetic, who is active. So this energy, it supports the associated states. It's like active state, energy that is energetic. If you want to help to others, you have to be strong yourself. So when you are strong, you can help others. So this energy, it helps other mental states support it. If you want to share with others, you have to have your own so that you can support them. So non-collapse, it doesn't fall off. It is um, in the commentary, this example is given, an old house is going to fall down then you have to put timbers so to support it so that it didn't fall off. So this is the meaning. And another interesting thing about this viriya is the sense of urgency, samvika, as the condition for the arousing of energy. Yes, we are uh, gradually, or we are getting old day by day, and we are getting mature day by day, and we are learning the Mars, so and we have to be energetic, we have to be active. We can stay idle, such kind of thing. Okay, let's move on. That is another one is PD. Yes, we are happy. We have PT for many occasions. In Yama also we just call PT. It is an adopted word. It is translated as join, zest, rapture. Sorry, rapture. And it takes delight on the pleasure. It takes delight in the object. Another interesting meaning, pleasurable interest. You find pleasure in the object. Pleasurable interest in the object, not disinterest in the object. What happens when you have PT? It refreshes your mind and body. Sometimes you are so happy and you so rejoice that you don't even feel like eating. You are already full or you are refreshed, you are light. 
you help somebody and things go well, I'm so happy, full of pity. Like your family members, your daughter passed exam, or your friend or your sister got promoted, so happy that uh, you feel so fresh. To pervade or thrill with rapture, it fills the whole body with this rapture or this pity and elation, very much happy. It is also a kind of jhana factor when developed. You know, when we are talking about jhana factor, it is very meaningful. Jhana absorption is a strong state, no doubt. So these jhana factor, they have the power or ability to suppress or to calm down their opposite state. Like Vyabhada or ill will or anger, right? This is the opposite of pity. Anger and pity, they are opposite. So when there, suppose you are feeling upset with somebody, then there is a saying, trying to, try to see good point in that person. Why? So that you have this pity and by the power of pity, you can remove or you can suppress your anger for a while. So this is sort of the function of jhana factor. So here it inhibits, uh, inhibits the hindrance of ill will. Yabada. It means opposite to ill will. And the first two factors I haven't explained, like vijaka, the thought. Sometimes your mind is overwhelmed or influenced by thought that you can't fall asleep, right? Have you ever experienced? Yes, very often. I'm very active and I, I'm very hardworking, for example, then you might feel that I have been thinking so much that I can fall asleep. So what happened on the contrary? When you are drowsy, when you are dull, in Pali we call Tina Meda, among the 14 mental states, the last two, sluggishness or dullness of the mind, right? drowsiness. So this is to be suppressed by this vitaka. This is the meaning thought. So when you are drowsy, then you try to cultivate, make some thoughts so that you feel refreshed. This is the meaning, okay? Then here, it's also interesting to see uh, different kinds of PT. Like it say the commentary give five kinds of PT. The first one, minor zest or minor PT. Pali kodaka PT. Kodaka means small. It make your your, uh, it raise your hair on the body. Uh, you feel so, maybe suppose you hear some kind of dhamma or you listen to a dhamma talk, let's say given by a venerable shadow, then hearing that dhamma, you feel so satisfied, so happy that you feel to have this um, goose flesh or you, you feel your hair are rising up on the body. It is like that. And sometimes it comes for a moment, like lightning, it would come for a moment. And this kind of momentary zest or PT, that is Kanika PT, it comes like a flash of lightning. It comes and it would go. And sometimes it would breaks over the whole body oh, for some time. You pay homage to the Buddha or listen to Radhamma or you attend to your object of veneration or desirable object so much that you feel as if your body is shower with pity. This is showering zest, breaking over the body like the ocean wave. You might often go to the beach and you swim in the beach and sometimes you go into the water, you stand or you sit there and you like the taste, right? The, the wave covering your body is like that. And obega bhiti, uplifting zest. It makes your body move up, causes the body to um, levitate, that is float or suspend in the air. During the time of the Buddha, you, you have heard of, you, uh, you have, might have heard of the story, like a person, a lady, she cannot go to the 
uh, to see the Buddha and hearing the Dhamma, she feels so rejoiced. She has this pity that her body got lifted up and with the, by the power of this jhana and she could go. Such thing. Then pervading zest, spreading the whole body like a cotton wool soaking in oil. You soak the cotton, cotton wool in oil. Then it got soaked the whole body. And this Paranapiti is like that, pervading the whole body. So different kind of zest. And the last factor among this um, six particular is the chanda. Chanda means desire to act or to perform. So simply, chanda itself means desire to act. There is no clinging, no liking, right? To perform an action or to achieve some result, just mere wish to do. <clears throat> so it's likened to stretching out the mind's hand toward the object. It does not refer to the hand, the physical hand, but it say the mind's hand. The mind just going out to take an object is like that. So it must be distinguished from desire in reprehensible sense, loba, greed, raga, and lust. It means desire can be different. Desire, desire to indulge in sensual pleasure, to enjoy music, enjoy your favorite food, like enjoy wearing your favorite dress, right? This is the Kamet Chanda. And another one, virtuous desire to achieve when arise with, un, arise with wholesome consciousness, Kusalet Chanda. You want to help others. Seeing a flower, uh, there are two choices. Somebody would uh, put on the head to beautify herself, or somebody would put in a vest, put it in the uh, dining hall to decorate, but another person ring to the shrine or altar and offer to the Buddha, so different. And you earn a living, not for the purpose of like um, gaining much more property, but for the purpose of supporting poor and needy. So such kind of desire is the wholesome desire. So desire itself, let's say is neutral when it goes together with desirable object or the object of craving or lust, it would become kamet chanda, tend to something unwholesome. And kusalet chanda means desire to study dhamma, desire to attain nibbana, desire to share knowledge. These are the kusalet chanda, okay? So it comes to the end of this uh, 13 uh, ethically variable states. So synonym of the term jada, somebody has asked some synonymous term of the jada. So vijnana, one word is vijnana. Like in the eye consciousness, we call jaku vijnana. In Bali, we call, in Myanmar, we call vijnye, right? Jaku vijnana. And here we have just studied this sentence. Depending on volitional activities, consciousness arises, just as I have explained in the different contexts of Sankara. Because of our past good action, now we are born as a human being. And at the very beginning, we have this mind, this consciousness arises. Here, Vijnana. Vijnana, here it refers to consciousness. So that is with reference to dependent origination. And another famous teaching, Manopo Bengamadama. Mind is the forerunner of the uh, phenomena. So Mana, this is also mind. And Manasa, there is also another synonymous term. And another term that you are familiar is the what we are studying today and a few days last week as well, Chetasika. Right? Chetasika means something that depends on the mind. Uh, so, Cheda and Ika. Cheda means here, synonymous term of Cheda or mind, and Ika means depending on. So, Chetasika means depending on consciousness for arising. Sometimes we use the mind and the heart interchangeably. She has very, she is very, uh, very good heart. 
it means she has good mind. And another word I like, and I have quoted here, karuna sitala hadiyam. Sitala means sita or sitala means cool and pleasant. Karuna means compassion. The heart or the cool mind imbue with compassion. When the mind has compassion, it is considered to be cool. So, karuna sitala hadiyam. So, hadiyam here does not refer to the heart, physical heart, but to the mind. So, these are the synonymous terms for your um, knowledge. Then, overview of the consciousness. Now, come. So, we have altogether 89 or 121 consciousness. And here we can subdivide into two groups. You see the marks with the tick, the correct mark. Mundane consciousness, that is the Lokiya Jada 81. And another one that on the last sentence, Supra Mundane consciousness, that is the Lokotra Jada, either 8 or 40. I'm just giving you an overview. And the first one, is the sense sphere consciousness. So there are different ways of classifying the mind. One way is by means of wholesome kusala and wholesome akusala, their result or the effect vipaka and functional consciousness or kiriya. This we have seen um, last week and I have also revised it today. Another way is classifying by means of plane of existence. So this we will uh, see very soon. The first one, sense fear consciousness, that is the kama vajara jada. A vajara means that is frequent, that arises mostly, right? Kama vajara jada means the jada or the consciousness that mostly arise in kama plane. Maybe those who don't know Kama Plane, I will show you in the next slide, right? Please just listen. They count 54. So this can be subdivided into three. That is unwholesome consciousness, Akusala Jada, 12 in number, and rootless consciousness, Ahituka Jada, that is 18. Uh, we have talked about root in Abhidhamma, which we call Hetu, right? This loba, dosa, moha, greed, hatred, delusion, they are evil roots. And on the contrary, we have a loba, non craving or generosity, a dosa, non hatred or loving kindness, a moha, non delusion or wisdom. These are three good roots or wholesome roots. So um, when we talk about the trees, the trees with a strong root, they are considered to be firm. We have to make lots of effort to uproot the tree. But here, rootless consciousness, they are weak type of consciousness and they count 18. Like our seeing consciousness, sense consciousness, let's say, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body. Your seeing consciousness, hearing consciousness, smelling, tasting, touching consciousness, they belong to this rootless group, okay? Because they are just the resultant type of consciousness. Resultant in the sense that when the mind and the object, this visible object get into contact with the mind, with, with the mind you have seen consciousness. So it comes as a result of meeting conditions. So they are rootless consciousness. And another one, sense fear, beautiful consciousness that is the Kama Sobana Jada, they count 24. So actually for us ordinary human being, including myself, our Jada pertains only to this 54, okay? But suppose you practice meditation strongly, dedicatedly till you attain jhana or absorption, number two, Fine material sphere consciousness, Rupa Vajra Jada, you will have. And the third one, immaterial sphere. It means that, like, you are the meditator or the yogi is so bored, so fed up with this physical body. Because of this physical body that we have to clean ourselves, we have to feed it, we have to. Um, 
cover with the clothes and we have to earn living and we have problems, all this because of this physical body. And that person after meditation become really fed up with this physical body. And with this perception, that person practice. So that meditation is the immaterial sphere. But this number three, in material sphere, arupa. Arupa mean no rupa, no physical body at all. Such kind of existence are also there. Only the mind, only the state of mind are there without any physical body in, the, in those brahmos. And the last one is the supramandan consciousness, local drajeda amount to either eight to all 40. That is of the Ariya Pokala, like Sota Bana, the stream winner, the stream winner mean who has already eradicated the wrong view and the doubt, sceptical doubt. Sceptical doubt mean the doubt in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and the Kama and its result. So that doubt has been completely removed. And so is the wrong view. So such kind of jada. So that belong to the noble person. Now, coming to the sense fear, Kama Bhumi, Kama Plane, it amounts to altogether 11. You know, sense fear plane is classified into two. The first one is the woeful plane, Apaya Bhumi. In Nyama, we call a Apaya right? Apaya Bhumi. Apaya me, Apa me, no lacking, devoid of. Aya me, happiness, no happiness. How? Because uh, you, you will see also see that it also include animal. So some pets like the cats and dogs and other pets, they live so well. Maybe some even live better than some human being. Then how can they be called this being in the woeful abode or the abaya? It says that it pain and the misery greatly exceed happiness. And there are further explanation there. The first one is hell, niraya. It means very strong suffering, intense suffering as a result of their evil deeds. And animal kingdom, why do they belong to Abaya? Why are they called Abaya or the um, beings in the hell, uh, in the Abaya? It means they does not provide the animal kingdom does not provide suitable condition for the performance of meritorious deeds because the cats and the dog, they, they can't do mer merits, right? And, uh, but the story is there like the frog listening to the damar uh, by the power of some uh, meritorious deeds in the past. As a result, when it dies, it goes to the celestial abode, but that is rare, but they themselves it's difficult for them. But like you might also see some animals, they can also do some kind of marriage. I don't know. Like we see in the uh, videos, like the elephants bowing down to the Sangha and also offering arms to the Sangha. And that, that would be very rare kind of thing that we can see. And another one, sphere of hungry ghost beta. In Myanmar, we call Beda, right? And the host of the tormented spirits like Beda and Asura. So they belong to Gamma plane. Then where are we now? Number two, the sensuous blissful abode, Gamma Sugadi Bhumi. Blissful abode, good place. So we are there. Number one, human realm, that is the Manosa Bhumi, our plane of existence. So Bhumi is translated as either plane or plane of existence. This we spell with B-L-A-N-E, plane of existence. And human being, those who know wholesome from unwholesome. In our world, in this human world, for example, there are billions and trillions of human beings, but are they really worth to be termed as a human according to this um, teaching? Like who knows or who can differentiate wholesome from unwholesome? That is the real human being. So we have to try to live up to that. And number two to seven, they are the six celestial abode. 
I don't think I will read. You, you can read yourself later. Then we come to this unwholesome consciousness, Akusala Jeda, that is greed rooted consciousness, Loba Mula, right? Root is Mula, so rooted consciousness, Loba Mula Jeda, hatred rooted consciousness, Dosa Mula and delusion rooted, Moha Mula Jeda, just to familiarize with you with some Pali terms. Then, Loba Mula Jeda eight, how come? Loba is only one, how can it become eight? So depending on these principle, three principles, the first one is feeling Vedana, right? Vedana, pleasant feeling and neutral feeling, two kinds of feeling. Loba Mula originally is Loba is only one because of feeling it become two, right? This attachment, with pleasant feeling or with neutral feeling. Another one is some association and dissociation with wrong view. That is the deity and um, prompted and unprompted. Prompted mean to be encouraged by oneself or by other and unprompted mean automatic, just as I have explained. So here, uh, this is just explanation for this Sankara. So if an action is unprompted or uninstigated, I added another word as I found in the consciousness uh, that is uh, taught by Venerable Siada Usatila, I have included. Perform quite voluntarily, unprompted me, or out of one's own free will, or entirely on one's own volition without hesitation, right? Uh, without prompting, entirely personal or self-originated. So these are the explanation for uh, deciding prompted and unprompted. And if it is prompted or instigated, not completely voluntary, not out of your own will, and you feel hesitant to do it, so it needs some effort either by yourself or by others. So it is this. So now come eight kinds of the greed rooted consciousness Loba Mula Jeda. So this is just for your um, information. Then it say, with pleasant feeling, with wrong view, unprompted. So you have to match like this, three columns. You choose, you take one from each column and you will get one consciousness. Like the first one, for example, with pleasant feeling, with wrong view, unprompted. Another one with pleasant feeling with wrong view prompted. You go this way, right? You can do this later. I give you example. Uh, this is the Pali version. For those who want Pali, you can have a look like Somanasa, Sahagada, Tetigada, Sambayoda, Asankarika, Jada. So this is uh, the combination. So here we have example. Before looking at this example, I just want to recall your memory. Loba. Loba is one of the root. And it does not stay alone. It has two followers. Right? Loba group is three, as we studied last week. It has strong view and it has conceit. Okay? Under the Loba, there are two followers or two disciples, wrong view, deity, and then conceit mana. Okay? So we will think depending on that. So I hope this example will give you some clear or better understanding. Number one. So this is illustration of eight consciousness. Number one, it says not knowing, taking intoxicant is unwholesome. A person at his own will happily enjoys taking drug. There are three parts. The first one concerning a person's idea, view or philosophy or thinking. What is the thinking? That person, what does he do? He or she do? Taking drug, taking some uh, sort of the intoxicants, maybe morphine or heroin or whatever, okay? Then what is the thought in that person? That person does not know. Taking such thing is akusala. Okay, what is the background of that person? 
that person does not know this taking drug is unwholesome or unethical. So it is his view or her view. So is it right? Is it right view or wrong view? It may not be right because the Buddha does not encourage to take drug. It is apparent in the uh, five precepts to refrain from taking intoxicants, either liquor or alcohol or whatever, um, any uh, cigar that has drug or like all these morphines and these things to uh, take enjoyment in oneself for pleasure, to take it for pleasure. It is not encouraged. Why? Because when a person takes such kind of intoxicant things, the mindfulness becomes very weak. It means the person senses are getting loose. Somebody would come and make some harm to them, they won't know because they themselves are involved and in getting lost in the enjoyment or this uh, pleasure of taking that drug. And once a person is addicted, then it becomes hindrance to maybe do his education or her education or the progress in life or the uh, progress in the spiritual practice. It is a kind of hindrance to human progress, let's say, or human well-being, physical and mental well-being. So it is considered akusala. So that person is considered to have wrong view. Okay, so it is with wrong view. Okay, the philosophy or the thinking of that person is wrong in, the, in terms of Buddhist teaching. Then what does that person do? A person at his own will, this is auto, out of his own will or her own will. This is unprompted. It is automatic, taking to be automatic. What happened? Happily, what is the feeling there? with pleasant feeling, then enjoys taking drug. So with pleasant feeling, that is happily, a person with wrong view, wrong view in the sense that because he or she does not know or does not accept taking intoxicant is something unethical or unwholesome, we consider to be wrong view. And this action is out of his own will or her own will that is unprompted. So this is one, the first Loba Mula Jada. So it shows all the possibility. So whenever there is Loba, it cannot be out of this eight. So this eight shows the possibility, not eight can really happen at one time. So the example is given, the condition are given. Number two, so is it clear? Is the first one clear? No? Are you with me? Not sure, maybe you're, you're already getting bored. So I, I will give one or two more example and we will finish. And the second one, not knowing, so the same view, but here insisted by a friend. So this is prompted one, not out of his own will or not out of her own will, the person still enjoys. So this is just the promptitude is changed. The first one is automatic or unprompted. Another one is prompted. And the third one, now the view is changed. That person knows. So it says, despite knowing, taking intoxicant is unwholesome. You know, addiction is very difficult to get rid of. Even like chewing beetle or like taking alcohol or taking drug, many people know it's not good, but it's difficult to get rid of. So the third person, that person know it taking drug is immoral, akusala, right? So that person does not have wrong view, but we can say right view because right view is only for the sake of kusala, right? That person, understand taking drug is not good. So that person does not have wrong view. Still, 
he indulges himself in taking drug happily out of his own will. This is another type. And the fourth one, that is with the promptitude, knowing it is not good, but prompted by a friend, a person does it happily. So this is the fourth one. So number one, two, three, four, they are with pleasant feeling. What is changed is only their view or their thought or their philosophy and being prompted or unprompted. So it formed the first four. And the next four, only the feeling got changed, become neutral. Maybe knowing this is not a good action, a person at his own will still indulges, but knowing it's not good, not so happily, but with neutral feeling, this is the thing. And in another occasion, insisted, insisted or encouraged by his friend or her friend. So it just showed the eight possibility and how Loba Mula Jada can become eight, right? Um, then another is the Dosa Mula and Moha Mula. And when we come to the Dosa Mula, it is with, with displeasure. Because when there is Dosa in mind, when there is anger, when there is irritation, when there is frustration, when there is depression, it says it with ill will. It changed from the original mind. Your mind is striking with this ill will and sometimes prompted. First, somebody talk ill of you. You don't feel anything, but later your friends say, okay, he or she is talking ill of you and you shouldn't, uh, you should think about this. Then this is prompted, right? But sometimes, at the first sight, somebody talk ill of you, you don't feel anything. But gradually after thinking, you understand the meaning of the word and you got angry. This is also prompted, prompted by oneself or prompted by other. In this way, dosa mula jada can be twofold. Then uh, the last one, moha mula jada, we have already studied that is with doubt, sceptical doubt, that is with wichi keja and restlessness, when the mind is restlessness, that is the odeja. So they both belong, uh, arise together with the neutral feeling. There cannot be pleasure, there cannot be um, displeasure, but with neutral feeling because they are weak, they are moha mula jeda. So I try to wrap, wrap up, this is how the 12 akusala jedas go. Uh, next week, I will refresh your memory. And today we have studied mainly two parts. The first one, I try to give you overview of the 52 mental states, classifying them into three groups. The first one, ethically variable or common mental state. They are agreeable to both good side and bad side. And the second group is the unwholesome akusala mental states, 14, which we have discussed detail last week. The third one, beautiful mental states, 25, we will do next week, right? After seeing that 13 ethically variable, which are agreeable to both good and bad, we try to see a brief overview of the 89 consciousness in that it has been classified according to plane of existence as karma plane where we are staying. And if you practice jhana, you would go higher realm, that is the rupa plane. And still we have to understand there are beings without physical body, we call them in material, no material or non-material, no physical body. In that out of the 54 Kama Vajra Jaira, we try to look at the 12 unwholesome, how Loba, despite its nature being attachment, craving, liking, clinging to the object, depending on the condition, it can altogether be amount to eight or how it become eight four. I try to give you with example or with illustration. Then we have a brief look of how Dosa Mula and Moha Mula can each be two altogether making 12. So I hope that um, at the second listening or so, and with the revision of the first lecture in the next, I hope 
you will be able to follow me. And for the next week, I will focus on the beautiful mental states, which we really need to be um, developed and which we really cherish. So thank you. Thank you so much for your patience and kind attention. May you always be well, happy and peaceful. And let me recite that uh, prayer for you. Bawadu sabak mangalam rakhantu sabak devada sabak boda nubawe na sada sukhi bawantu de bawantu me. May there be all blessings. May the deities protect you. By the power of the Buddha, by the power of the Dhamma, by the power of the Sangha, may you all be well, happy, peaceful, and accomplished. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So we will conclude by reciting Buddha Sasanam Jiran Theta to three times, wishing the teachings of the Buddha to last long. Buddha Sasanam Jiran Theta to Buddha Sasanam Jiran Theta to Buddha Sasanam Jiran Theta to Sadhu Sadhu Sadhu. May the teachings of the Buddha last long. May the teachings of the Buddha last long. May the teachings of the Buddha last long. Well done, well done, well done. So thank you very much. Have a good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Thank you. Thank you, Seali. And also thank you for everybody to attending this class and uh, make sure that you attend this class too, more and more important for the next class. Okay, now then uh, we will end this session. Okay, thank you.